Good morning and a warm welcome to the 2020 Eureka Alert PIO seminar, both to you here who have traveled near and far to join us in Seattle and to everyone who's watching us uh, via live webcast. My name is Jennifer Holshu and I'm the Deputy Director of Editorial Operations for Eureka Alert. Uh, some of you may not know me, but I have been working at Eureka Alert for the last 12 years and for a large part of that time, I was one of the staff members who process your news release submissions or respond to your emails to our webmaster or who answer the phone when you call our office. Over the course of those 12 years, I have observed also how practices both new and familiar in the scientific publishing world have impacted how you, the public information officers, do the work of communicating the latest discoveries from researchers at your institutions. Embargoes, advanced online publication, and open access are a few, couple of the big ones that come to mind. And to add to that list more recently is the emergence of the preprint server. So preprints, for the purposes of our discussion today, are research paper manuscripts that have been made available publicly on a platform by the researchers who wrote them and that have not been peer reviewed. Preprints have received a fair amount of attention in science communication circles, and those discussions have largely debated about the question of whether preprints should be covered by the news media at all. There have also been substantive discussions centered around whether and how to promote preprint papers on public health related topics in particular, although preprint servers for other disciplines also exist. For our seminar this year, we wanted to dig deeper into this topic of preprints because if one thing is obvious, preprints are not going away anytime soon. So we thought it would be interesting to hear from PIOs directly about their considerations and strategies around promoting preprints spanning a range of subjects so that we might start a conversation that aids the larger com PIO community of practice in figuring out what your approach could look like the next time your scientist comes to you wanting to promote their new preprint paper. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we start the discussion. If you're live tweeting, please use hashtag PIOSEM20. For the Wi-Fi, the newsroom Wi-Fi network does not transfer up here. Um, so you should be able to access the general meeting Wi-Fi network, <coughs> hashtag AAASMTG. The password is the same, hashtag AAASMTG. We are recording this entire event and we'll make the video available next week on the Eureka Alert website. And you will need to log into your PIO account to access it. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. I'm Megan Fallon. I'm the executive director for the Science Press Package at AAAS Science, where we promote research from the six science family journals, Science and its sisters, to 6,000 reporters every week. And we work with a lot of you, and we really appreciate everything you do uh, to, to give us terrific assets every single week, every month of the year. I'm Linda Glazer. I'm the news and media relations manager for the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. I'm Carl Bates. I'm really loud. I'm the director of um, I'm the director of research communications at Duke University, and I'm also a member of this advisory board that helps Eureka Alert guide future decisions. Hi, I'm Matthias Jäger. I'm the press officer of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany. And I'm Beth Baker. I'm senior, senior media relations manager at PLOS. Like Megan, I help to um, promote the research that PLOS publishes. Thanks, everybody, for, for rolling with the, the punches. It's like a day in the press office, really, where we have to do that so much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. This is a topic that I spend a lot of time thinking about, and I think it's great to be here with all of these experts and with all of you to have some, some good discussions that could guide us all. So today we're going to hear from veteran PIOs across the university and scientific organization and journal landscape about how they think about preprint promotion in different circumstances. 
circumstances. After we hear a little bit from each panelist, because they'll present to us in brief about how they do this in their position at their uh, organization, I'm going to pose some tough questions to them, uh, the questions that I thought about at home that I thought might be on all of your minds, and I hope that that will be a helpful discussion. One among these, or, or maybe two, will be related to the coronavirus situation, which has brought preprints and rapid data sharing to the forefront. So we should talk about that uh, by a little bit before noon so that we can make sure to leave plenty of time for your questions. I'll open it up to Q&A. We have a mic here. People can come to the mic and ask questions of our panelists. Uh, also, so that this event provides as much value as possible for everybody here and doesn't overlap with discussions on preprints maybe you've been part of before, I will uh, articulate three hopes hopes and dreams. Uh, one, that we could you know, stay away from using about whether reporters should cover preprints. I think there have been a lot of discussions on that already. Also, uh, even as we discuss the coronavirus, I hope that we can not limit our focus to health and medical related preprints. Again, there have been a lot of discussions there already, some of which were led by the London UK and, uh, London SMC, which will be on the line if they're not already. Um, I think we all recognize that, that health and medical preprints need extra care and consideration. In this event, though, we really want to hear from PIOs who are working in disciplines that have a long history of preprints, including the life sciences. So without further ado, we'll get started. I wanted to ask you all two questions first. Uh, could you please raise your hand if in the last year you've encountered a, a preprint issue or, or delight in your, your daily work? All right. Uh, uh, if if an, uh, someone at your institution has come to you and said, I have a preprint, I would like to promote it to the press now, I'm wondering how to think about this, or reporters have reached out to me even as it's not yet peer reviewed, that kind of thing. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> so many in the room. Um, could you raise your hand if you could name uh, three or more preprint servers? Okay. All right. So this gives a good sense, because I think there are more than three out there. Uh, so we're really fortunate today to have on our panel Linda, who works at Cornell, and their university library houses Archive, which is the first preprint to have been established. So I'm going to ask Linda to start today by giving us a little background on preprint servers, why they were established, and the value that they bring to the scientific community and maybe also to the communications landscape. So take a look at this. Uh, this is where all your preprint troubles started. <laughs> um, this unassuming computer was stuck under Paul, physicist Paul Ginsparg's desk. Um, back in 1991, he wanted to create a system for rapid dissemination of research. Uh, and more importantly, he wanted to create uh, a system whereby researchers in third world countries, developing countries, excuse me, um, and people from institutions that, uh, smaller institutions, could have as much access to the latest research happening um, as somebody from an Ivy League institution. So this was born archive in 1991. He expected about 100 submissions a year from, for his small uh, subfield of high uh, particle physics, theoretical physics. and. That's not what happened. He was tapping a huge unmet need. Next one. So this is what archive looks like now. It gets well, uh, way over 150,000 submissions a year. 70% uh, of those are from outside the United States. So he achieved his goal of leveling the playing field for everybody. Um, it, it's housed, as, as um, Megan said, at uh, Cornell University. And it gets about more than 260 million downloads a year, OK? Um, that's the world we live in now. And those downloads are from all over the globe. So I want to share with you a couple of key things to know about Archive. 80% um, of the preprints that are posted on Archive uh, end up published in traditional journals. So these are not crackpot papers. Uh, these are. Um, serious papers by scientists who are aware that 
anything that's posted in our archives stays there forever. So they don't want to be embarrassed, so they tend to be pretty careful about what they put up. The other 20% that doesn't get published in tradi traditional journals, most of those weren't ever intended for traditional journals. There are things like conference proceedings and so forth. So um, while there are some uh, requirements for something that goes up on archive, including it has to be somebody who is affiliated with a reputable institution, um, and they have to be publishing in their field. So those are the requirements. But the standards are pretty different from what we as PIOs think about. So the papers that uh, get through the filters and the human moderators have to be of interest, relevance, and value to the research communities. Uh, that populate archives. So that's really different from what we think about um, as a peer review paper. But scientists really do feel that it's worth seeing these papers, even if they're not fabulous science, because it helps them uh, know what's going on in their field. It gives them useful information. As we know, reporters will publish something that is on archive willy-nilly, and that's the world we live in. There are other preprint servers. There's BioArchive, which Beth's going to talk about more. There is uh, SSRN for social sciences, has a first look section for preprints. Astronomy has a, its own uh, preprint server, although astronomy, astronomy is also an archive. So why do, why do researchers want to use these preprint servers? Why are they bedeviling us with these uh, non-peer-reviewed things? Well. Anything posted in the archive has a date stamped, so it establishes the priority of that research, and it's accepted by the scientific community. So that's important to researchers. Preprints are also used as evidence of recent productivity for job seekers, um, early, you know, early career scientists, as well as people looking for grants. The grant institutions, if it's a a research community that posts on archive, they will look on archive to see if that researcher has been productive lately. And again, those are things that are not yet in peer-reviewed journals. Um, so for many fields of physics, mathematics, and computer science, this is the primary mode of research communication for those scientists. So it's used for improving articles, um, visibility, archival findability, which is really important. Uh, that's the 260 million downloads that I, that I mentioned. And here's, here's an interesting uh, point of fact, that every research community that has adopted archive for rapid dissemination, none of those has abandoned archive since. So preprints are here to stay. Great. Thanks, Linda. That's helpful. Now we're going to hear from all of the panelists about how they are you know, working with uh, researchers at their institutions or with authors who will be publishing with them handle questions that come up about preprints and promotion um, and related. So we'll start with Linda and then just move down the line. So despite the fact that we host archive at, at Cornell University, our, we follow pretty much industry best practices. Uh, we only promote peer-reviewed research through our press office. So uh, that means it's published in a peer-reviewed journal or it's been presented at a conference, a scientific conference, um, in which case that's how we, we cover it as such. Except in fields like economics, right? So economics has had this really long delay in publication that's resulted in a culture where white papers are posted online and commented on in advance of publication. There aren't embargoes for those papers, so it's a very different kind of playing field. Um, and I did want to mention that sometimes we do, uh, we do have a faculty member who wants us to promote their research that's not been peer reviewed yet, or for some reason it's already out there in the world, reporters have reported on it, what do we do? Um, so what we do is we write a research in process, a research profile of that researcher and of that research. And it might include the results that they found that haven't yet been published, but we don't present it to reporters as, here are these findings. Rather, here is what they've been doing, here's what they've found so far. So it's a way of getting that research out to reporters, out into the general world, without claiming something more than it is. Okay. Um, Carl Bates from Duke again. I, I can think of only two instances in my nearly 20 years of doing this where I've been asked by faculty to, to publicize a preprint. 
One was a physicist who, again, in the tradition of physics and astronomy, had a preprint coming, and he wished to, one, make sure that we had a press release to help people interpret this very arcane technical result properly, and two, frankly, to call his peers' attention to it so that they could look at it on the preprint. In that case, we did do a clearly labeled release. Here's what they think is going on. It's in this preprint stage. People are arguing about it now, but we thought you ought to know. The second one is the one that landed me here on this panel, I think, because it was just a couple months ago. We had a faculty member who was giving testimony in Washington about coal ash standards, coal ash cleanup, and he wanted to make sure that this word got out. It was actually um, testimony for a rulemaking process at EPA, and he wanted to make sure that his message, he had actual data, he wasn't just thinking about this hypothetically, he wanted to make sure that his data got out into the public discussion before the rulemaking happened. Eureka Alert turned it away. It didn't fit their peer review standard. So that's what landed me here. Um, from my two cents, the reason we do any press release is to help uh, journalists and the general public interpret a very difficult, arcane, technical piece of work that is that is difficult for anybody outside the field of that paper to interpret well. I, I see it as a, a form of insurance. Um, the, the negative spin on that is that it's framing, that we're framing the discussion. But uh, I'm okay with that. I, I think we serve an important role as PIOs, as the people who do that first breakdown of the paper to help under, help folks understand what's in it. If they want to go deeper in the reporting, great, but as you know, being on our side of the business, most of them take our word for it. Okay, so from my side, um, I've been lucky, so to say, I've never encountered a scientist who wanted to publish his work before it was through the peer review process, because I would have to turn him down. Uh, and any organization I've been working so far was the clear statement we only talk about science which has been gone through the peer review process. Uh, at AMBLE we currently try to rethink this idea, if it's really um, 21st century standard to have a peer review, or if it's enough that people comment on a preprint server enough and say, okay, what you've done seems good, basically a peer review without an official peer reviewer. Uh, the only problem is, of course, manpower. So I'm the only press officer, we have 900 researchers, and they're very, very productive. If I now start to also cover research which hasn't gone through the official peer review process without having a month of warning before, uh, I'll drown in work. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how this is evolving in the future. Um, so at PLOS, we support preprints. We think they're a good thing for science. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about um, PLOS's work with preprints, and in particular with bioarchive. Um, so this graph shows uh, how preprints are really exploding in the life sciences. So um, you can see that uh, bioarchive and the advent of bioarchive has had a huge impact on the landscape for the life sciences. Um, this data is a little bit out of date, um, but that's the, the latest graph um, I have for you. Um, but you can see how, how the, the green bar, that's bioarchive, that's really increasing um, over time, and in particular in the last few years. Um, we think they help researchers to communicate with other researchers. That said, um, we don't support the communication um, actively to the media of preprints. We believe, like many others on the panel, that research should be communicated with journalists at the post-peer review stage, so when there's a paper um, to be published. So that's how we handle things at PLOS as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you haven't said it. Oh, yes, a little bit about the preprint landscape more generally. Um, so you can see that preprints are still a fairly small part of science communication. Um, so around about 30,000 preprints were posted in 2019 on BioArchive, and you can see how that compares to the PubMed figures. Um, we, I was saying that quite a lot of authors have opted, in, opted into our partnership with BioArchive. We've posted around 4,300 to date. That's since mid-2018. Um, and I mentioned the figures for plus computational biology and how almost half of authors opt into that. Uh, we find that overall around 18% of PLOS authors either opt in through our partnership or they post a preprint separately themselves. So that's roughly the figures for PLOS. We find that our authors are quite supportive of preprints. They tend to publish in PLOS at least in part because they support open access and for them they can see preprints as a good way of facilitating that with their scientific community. Jen, do you want to remind us what Eureka Alert stands on preprints is as relates to submitting news releases? Yes, yeah. of course. So as Carl alluded to, um, at this time, Eureka Alert does not 
accept news releases that are solely based on a preprint paper, and this is in accordance with our long-standing news release eligibility criteria. Um, however, there are a couple of exceptions that do fall within these eligibility criteria. The first is if the preprint has also been submitted and accepted by a peer-reviewed journal. We would accept a news release under that circumstance. Um, however, we do encourage you to check the journal's policy first, as they may have their own specific rules about media outreach at that stage of the publication process, particularly if that journal uses an embargo. Um, the second exception that falls within the criteria is if the preprint paper's findings have been recently presented at a scientific conference, then we will also accept the news release. Um, so should you submit a release that falls under one of these two exceptions, um, we do ask that you include the pertinent journal, publication, or scientific meeting information prominently in your news release, as well as the article's DOI or conference abstract URL within the news release in addition to the preprint paper URL. Um, so our 90-day rule, which basically means that the research paper or the conference must have taken place within the last 90 days of submitting the release, still applies here. And um, so with these considerations in mind, this is our policy at this time. However, should any aspects change in the future, we will communicate this to uh, your, our PIO members. Thanks, Jen. Great. So now we get to the fun part, the questions. Um, I'll start with a few, and then we will open it up to you all for questions, too. But I think as we've heard from our speakers, there's a lot of there, there seems to be a fair amount of consistency in the way that things are handled, um, and yet there's room for discussion because there, there are new promotion challenges and opportunities out there. So the questions will try to probe that a little bit. I did just want to first ask for those who are um, at universities or scientific organizations, when your researchers are excited about preprints, and you've talked a little about this, Linda, you mentioned the date stamp being important. Carl, you talked about visibility to other researchers of important uh, physics uh, findings. Um, what are the other reasons that your researchers say they, they really value preprints when you're talking to them one-on-one? -on -one? I'll go first. Um, so uh, our researchers tend to support preprints for many of the reasons that you guys have mentioned already. Um, particularly, they're very keen to share their research and they believe in disseminating their research within their communities and preprints are a really effective way for them to do that. So it's increasing visibility as well um, for them. Uh, they see the importance of being able to stake a claim to say, uh, I, I did this research first and preprints are a very quick and early way to share their research. Um, whereas traditionally some journals can take even years to publish research, um, preprints can be posted very quickly so they can show that, that they've been researching um, and they've got the first prior claim to that, to that research. Um, and particularly for our early career researchers, although for also for researchers at all stages, the ability to um, show evidence of their work uh, in, in a format that looks um, more impressive and enables more scrutiny than simply saying something is in press is particularly important when they're applying for jobs, um, for grants, or for tenure. So it's a way for them to demonstrate their work, even if they've not yet got a published paper. Oh, there's hardly anything to add to that, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, but probably I can uh, bring an example. Uh, what we had recently at Amble, uh, a, a good example on uh, why preprints are important. So I hope you all last week uh, saw the news on the Pan Cancer Project. Uh, if not, just do me a favor, not <laughs> that you've seen it. So it was a, a big initiative uh, led by Anvil and several other institutions. Um, so we, it was a worldwide initiative. So we had uh, 1,300 researchers from 70 countries, more than uh, several hundred institutions involved. And what they did is they analyzed the genome of cancers of the more than 2,500 cancer genomes of 38 different cancers and created a huge database uh, of genomes. Uh, they also, of course, analyzed the data. They developed new techniques to analyze this genome. And the good thing was um, the whole project started uh, six years ago. And the paper which presented the results and the project was published online on a preprint in July 2017. 
Um, yeah, last week we had um, the official press release uh, together with a lot of institutions worldwide and uh, media coverage of about 160 million people we reached. And the crazy thing is if you go on the preprint server and you see how often people refer to this paper, you get 100 publications which have been made between the upload of the paper on the preprint server and the actual press release on the paper itself. So imagine if the researchers decided like, no, we wait till the paper is public in science or nature, nature it was in this case, till we go out to the other science community and share our data, then we would have less than 100 papers. So I think it's very, very important that the data is shared early so that our can work with it as well. Um, the sense I have from faculty is that preprints are good for science. They are annoying to some PIOs and dangerous somewhat to the press, but I think they're good for science. And the faculty I know who are taking advantage of them eagerly want that input from their peers before they take a shot at a big journal. They'd rather have, I mean, the, the whole process of science, right, is to try to argue and knock the thing down. Somebody builds this beautiful argument and then the next guy tries to knock it over. So preprint accelerates all of that and it happens a lot faster. Um, the, the example I hope we're going to get to is the Indian paper about the um, coronavirus having similar similarities to HIV. They were wrong and within three days their peers told them they were wrong and it was over. You think about the old method, they would have sent that to a journal and waited months for it to come out. It would come out if it got past peer review. And then, you know, people would take out their quill pens and write letters to the editor about how wrong it was, and many months later you'd start to hear the blowback. For good or ill, this was done in five days. So that to me is, I think, good. And sort of taking off on that, um, here's an example of another reason why preprints are so important to scientists. Uh, Grigori Perelman was awarded both the Fields Medal, which is the highest honor in math, and the $1 million Millennium Prize for his Poincaré, pardon my pronunciation, his Poincaré conjecture proof. And that proof appeared only on archive. He never published it in a mm. peer review journal. Mm. So um, people are paying attention to what's on archive, what's on these preprint servers in general. Yeah, so it's, it's really clear that preprints serve an incredibly important function for scientists who are communicating with each other in their disciplines, even outside of it. Um, how about you all as, as advisors to, to researchers who come to you and they have a preprint, what do some of those conversations look like? Uh, can you give us some specifics about how you're advising them and what you're teaching them about the media landscape as part of that process? So I'll start. Sure. Um, so this is, a, this is a teaching moment, in my opinion, <laughs> right? This is a moment to, to sit them down and say, what are your goals? Why is it important to you to do this now? What do you think you'll achieve by doing this? And here's why you shouldn't do this, or here are the considerations that might not uh, have the same outcome if you do it as a preprint versus waiting until it's in a traditional peer review journal. And most researchers, I, well, I shouldn't say most, many scientists, especially early career scientists, but even those who are later, have no clue about how embargoes work and how pitching under embargo works or how the whole press release thing happens. So this is a moment, you know, they, they know what they want, which is for everybody to write about their research, but they're coming from this little world of their specialized research community that's talking about things on preprints and they don't know how to translate that into the larger world. So that's, I, that's how I see my role as a PIO is to take them from that point to this point um, and, and help them to learn what's best for them and for their research. I, we haven't been asked for it much. Um, when I'm aware that something's out on a preprint Frankly, I hold my breath and hope that nobody notices it. And for the most part, you know, journalists are not cruising the primary literature or the preprints. Um, they maybe would pick up the scent of one of these things if it's getting a lot of talk on Twitter, um, whereupon it would be too late for me to close that barn door. So, like I say, I just hold my breath a lot. Yeah, so we at Amble, we encourage our scientists to talk about their uh, preprint um, papers on their own personal Twitter channels or on the Twitter channels they have for their groups. 
but I also make it very clear like if the story is then out then it's too late for me to do a proper press release and if you want to get the full package with visuals with a, pr a press conference with briefing with whatever you like then you have to hold it back and yeah get me the lead I guess I work a little less directly with researchers than some of you guys do, um, but I would absolutely agree that it, it can be a real um, moment to educate scientists about the media and how it works and how it can best work. And um, we may not be the experts on the science, but we are the experts on, on communication with the media. It's what we do. So I think we should feel confident in, um, in informing researchers about, about the best way to communicate their science. And for me, that's not communicating at the preprint stage. I do want to add one thing, though, which is that um, the world is changing. So the, the old um, kind of uh, structure is, uh, is changing with, with the internet and so forth, and, and these very innovative multimedia, uh, interactive kinds of uh, platforms. So some, some research scholarship that's coming out is not necessarily going to end up in a traditional journal in the end. So it raises some questions about those kind, that kind of research. What do you do with that? Um, is, it, is it maybe not covered as research? Is it a new platform? Is that how you cover it? But um, I just did want to throw that out there, that, that there's, there's more challenges than just you know, this sort of uh, orderly pr progression towards a traditional journal that we, we have to deal with now. Yeah. Interesting things like uh, negative findings, maybe, or, or other kinds of research that don't fit the traditional bill. Uh, I mean, I, I should say that you can still publish negative findings. It's something we encourage at PLOS One. We're um, really yeah. keen for researchers to submit even their null results to us, and we'll publish those just like others. So um, I, I agree the research landscape is changing. Some things will still fit within the journal model, and, and some maybe not. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, and Carl, uh, you mentioned we, do, we don't know how much reporters are cruising the, uh, the preprint landscape. I did query some folks I know, and they use this little website. I thought I'd tell you all about it. It's called archivist.org. That's R-X-I-V-I-S-T dot O-R-G. Some reporters I know are using this to look at the preprints that are most tweeted about by other mm. researchers. So if you went there in the last two days, you would see the coronavirus preprint on the taxonomy debate uh, had been tweeted 579 times, for example, and was at the top of the list. Uh, so, so I think that's a way some reporters have uh, started to try to stay ahead of, of preprints and, and look for story ideas, just to make you aware. Um, so shifting a little bit then to thinking uh, uh, not about the conversations maybe that PIOs are having so much with researchers, but reporter behavior and the news coverage outcome that we're all mindful of. I wondered if maybe Beth, from, from your perspective, you could talk a little bit about how you've seen news coverage at the preprint stage, if it happens for papers that you handle, influence coverage of final peer-reviewed results from your journal. What does that look like? Yeah, we actually, uh, I can't think of examples where we've really seen that. It's not been super common for us so far. My sense, and I'd love to hear what you all think, is that mostly the journalists who are looking at preprint servers are those journalists who are um, very specialised science journalists. They they feel that they have the skills that they need to assess the science and to choose whether to report on it or not on that basis. Whereas a journalist who works more in the mainstream media is maybe less inclined to look at preprints at the moment. Um, I would love to hear if anyone does have any examples where they feel that coverage at the preprint stage has affected coverage later on. Um, we certainly wouldn't change whether we publish a paper or not based on whether it's received coverage at the preprint stage. Um, and actually, in terms of the communication around that paper, if we uh, had seen a preprint of that paper and it had changed significantly, perhaps such that the findings were actually different by the time it came to publication, we would see that as a, a responsibility of ours to be communicating that change and the ways in which that paper was different. So um, we would be able to, in a sense, correct the narrative um, with our communications. Um, as we all know, communication isn't just about promoting a paper, it's also about um, helping journalists to understand the, the science. Um, and to shape the narrative. So we would want to do that um, where there have been that significant change in the group. That's great. That really is a model. 
Um, I, I want to touch a little bit on coronavirus because it's been in the news a lot. Uh, Carl mentioned the uncanny virus preprint that was on BioArchive and then withdrawn. I think that's the first time I've seen that. It did happen rapidly, however, which was, was great, although a lot of news stories were written uh, about it uh, and sparked some public concern. I, th I think a relevant question for this group is, is what does this situation in any discipline, um, health or some other kind of science, create for a PIO even before they think it was their time to promote and, and think about the related piece of research. So in other words, even if you'd normally wait to promote until the peer-reviewed version, if a preprint authored by someone at your institution on a high-profile prof public interest topic uh, gets a lot of notice, is that the time to get out there and be doing some some communication? Um, could you all reflect on that a little bit? Um, I would I would say yes, definitely. Um, it should get uh, clear communication and what the research stage is and what's going on, which changes might be expected, contradictions which are in there, so that journalists and the public are really aware of. Okay, that's not the final stage. There can be change. In, if if our folks were doing a preprint about coronavirus and were kind enough to let us know they were doing that even, <laughs> um, that being such a hot topic right now and so much public anxiety, I would very much want to do a release to make the point that this is preliminary and also, again, to help people interpret the technicalities of it. Here's what they're saying this paper includes. Uh, to me, again, a press release is sort of protection for our researchers to make sure that their work is interpreted correctly. And I'm sure all of you send your work past the researcher as the final step so that they sign off so that the release is saying what they want it to say about their work. That's our protective function and I think it would be very important in an instance like that. If you had a really hot topic and you knew your folks were going to put some data out to get ahead of it and say this is what's in this paper and it's preliminary, they're sharing it because this is an urgent case, but it may not be right. I'm not sure that we would necessarily um, send out a release. Um, obviously, this is a case-by-case -case kind of thing. What exactly. we would probably yeah. be more likely to do is some hand-pitching to journalists um, that this is an expert who is working on this topic and has this research and has, you know, as you said, these preliminary findings. So it would be a more of a targeted kind of a distribution rather than sort of a more general press release that would go on your alert or something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's probably smart. Yeah, I, I really like that idea. Um, I mean, although we wouldn't encourage uh, press officers to promote research at the preprint stage, if the preprint's already out in the media and it's being miscommunicated and there's misconceptions, I do think there's a real role for us to clear that up. Yeah. And I think um, personal approaches with journalists and giving them the opportunity to ask their questions and get accurate answers is a really valuable tool in clearing up those mm. misconceptions. Great. Uh, just one last question before I open it up. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, Carl, uh, researchers giving you courtesy notice about their preprints. Yeah, wouldn't that any, be nice? Do you have any <laughs> tips, anyone, for how to make that happen? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess I would say if, if it's a paper and um, you, it's, it's coming up in a PLOS journal, come and talk to us. We would love to let you know when papers are, are going to be published and to help you with that. So talk to journals. Um, I, I hope I can speak for other journals as well, but certainly at PLOS, we, we do want to give you all the information you need to do your press work. So um, yeah, talk to the journal. Okay. Great. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. So now, um, if, if anyone in the audience has questions, we have a microphone here. I think we'd be happy to have people line up and ask. And I think Shelby will handle questions from online viewers. Uh, online viewers, please do state your name and affiliation or type it into the chat when you're asking your question. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. So we have a question from a PIO online. Has anyone received backlash from reporters or other stakeholders when they promoted a preprint paper? I think this is a general question for the panel and also those in the audience. No. No. <laughs> Sorry. Because I've only done it twice. Yeah. We have a curious situation at Cornell because we host Archive, which is that very often uh, reporters who are writing about a preprint posted on Archive will attribute it to Cornell. Oh. <laughs> so my apologies if that's one of your researchers that that's happened with. Um, 
typically I've found, though, that those are small outlets, very often not necessarily very experienced reporters. So as I think somebody else mentioned, it kind of disappears. It doesn't get picked up by lots of other outlets, so, which is a good thing. I'd love to know if any of you have had that experience. Do come and tell us. Yeah. Yeah, please, please get in line. Uh, the next question. Yeah. So archive does not have comments on it. Um, that's deliberate because it's, it's an archive. It's not meant to be a you know a blog site. So that it does have a feature. I think it's called trackback, uh, where on a paper it will uh, list the places that that paper has been cited, so that you can go and see you know where the comments are. So for example, that blog site, um, which I, I can't answer your specific question as to whether archive. I don't believe that Archive has any official function for any of those comment sites, but I'm not 100% sure, but I, my understanding is that they don't because, again, that's not Archive's function. Now, individual people affiliated with Archive may be running those, um, but Archive was really designed very, as a very specific archival kind of site, so that's hopefully answers your question. Uh, Anthony, anything for you? Um, just the mention of blogs, the last time I heard about one of our scientists posted on the archive, um, the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, has a blog, and I doubt he writes it, I'm not sure who writes it, but he wrote about something that our scientists had posted on the paper, in his, his blog post last week or two weeks ago. So um, that came to my attention, and I just, uh, you know, re promoted his blog post. Um, and I think that social media is kind of fair game for promoting preprint information as opposed to a full press release, but I don't know, I'd be interested in people's thoughts about that. Um, the second thing I'm wondering is, um, in terms of the papers that get onto preprint servers, is there any standard of where they're at? I mean, are they to typically the scientists at the same time submitted to a journal? Or could it be really preliminary and you know, are they, are, do the preprint servers have any uh, guidelines in terms of this is when you should submit or this is too early? So on archive, well, um, no. I mean, people choose when they feel ready to, to, to post it. As I said earlier, there is this sort of um, peer pressure not to post something that you're going to be embarrassed by later because it's just got dumb errors in it. So uh, you know, that encourages people to at least think carefully before they post it. Archive, uh, I think this is true of all the preprint servers, it's really about the, in, the kinds of research that people within that specialized community are interested in and not that you know, it's perfect results or something like that. Yeah, I guess uh, certainly I think that pressure to, that you, you're putting out your work publicly, so um, researchers are going to be thinking about that. Although I would say that we did see with the coronavirus preprint that the researcher in question, one of the researchers said that they had felt under pressure to get to share their results as soon as possible, which you can understand in that sort of situation. So that's perhaps the converse view. But yes, there isn't, I believe, any um, uh, requirements to have be at a certain stage before posting your research from the preprint server. And, and just to, to um, your, your second part of your question about social media. So from our perspective, and I'll be interested to hear what, what you all have to say about it, um, posting something on social media is still if we're doing it as an institution, it's still giving it our imprint, right, our cachet. Absolutely. So if it turns out to be wrong or bad in some way or harmful in some way in the case of life sciences, it comes back to haunt us. Mm -hmm. So again, if we were to say something on social media about one of those preprints, it would be about research in progress and not about the results. And that would have been my answer for you, Diana. Yes, you can and should use social media, but some of your 280 characters have to be devoted to the word preliminary or provisional. I don't know which is shorter. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of retweet. As a scientist, yeah. they put their own information about their research, and I retweet, but maybe I should have added something. Yeah. This is the preliminary. But 
again, I think that's a beautiful thing. People put something on a preprint, and their peers are all talking about it in real time, and in tweeting, "Hey, check out this preprint that so and so just put up. This is really exciting." Mm -hmm. Argument, argument, argument. I mean, we're getting to see the process that used to happen in conferences or in c correspondence that often stretched over months. And it's really cool. Yeah. I guess, yeah, certainly where you're communicating with scientists, you know, preprints are, are beneficial in that way. I guess I would be a little wary in terms of uh, the public. Um, obviously, have access to Twitter as well. So I think those caveats you mentioned are really important. Um, you wouldn't want anyone to get the wrong end of the stick. I'm so glad you brought that up, Beth. I've been waiting for this. So, <laughs> so last year, or last week rather, Ed Young had a piece in which somebody said, you know, it's a terrible thing that the public can see these preprints about coronavirus because they might get the wrong idea. Which struck me as that sort of paternalistic argument that we can't share what we're doing with the people. They will misinterpret it. We shouldn't tell them anything. I don't. I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, yes, they, they, yeah. they get, yes, they may get the wrong idea, but have you looked at Twitter lately? They get the wrong <laughs> idea whether we help them or not. Right, uh, preprints so, are available to everyone, but so I think- you know, Unbalance, it's a plus, I think. Right, but I think we do have the role to, um, to be really clear about when something's been peer reviewed or the limitations of things that have and haven't yeah. been shown, and um, I think we have to be extra careful about that when things are available to the public. Yep. Um, I had a question for the PIOs in the panel and in the audience. How often do you publish about um, those papers that are on the preprint service that have been accepted by the journal but are not published by the journal yet and what your opinion about them to publish or not? Uh, I would never do it, um, <laughs> <laughs> mainly because of risking uh, basically to break the embargo of the shovel. In yeah. the worst case, the Sean could say, well, if you've already talked about it now, then we won't publish it anymore. Yeah. Because the journal's embargo will allow you to do preprint, but it doesn't allow you to do press. So yeah. even so though it's in play, stage. we shouldn't be talking about it until the journal embargo is out. Well, it depends. It's, yeah. it's it, it varies it's from hard. journals. That's right. Yeah. Some journals don't give a rip about embargo. Absolutely. Right. Right. But others will. Right. And humanities, for example, if uh, pretty much if you've you know, if there's something that's out there already, they're not going to publish it. So, yeah. yeah we'd certainly say once, once research has been accepted by a journal, you should be um, abiding by the journal policies at that point. If there isn't an embargo, we are happy if it's a forthcoming piece and there's no embargo and there's some reason to do something earlier, travel schedule with the professor or something, then yeah. that's fine. You know, and there's no reason not to at that point because but that's really, you've got to be really careful with, with the journal. I guess to be safe, maybe you check with the journal. Oh, absolutely, yeah. check with the journal. You should, all, I mean, you probably all know this already, but whenever we get news that something has been accepted to a journal, the first thing you do is find out what that journal's policies are and if there's somebody that you should be in contact with. And on behalf of PLOS, I fully approve of that. <laughs> and, one, and at Science, our policy for papers in that position where there's a preprint counterpart and the, the paper itself is accepted, it, when we hear from researchers who say, or authors who say, a reporter's reached out to me now well, about the preprint version that's out there, say, that's great. Go ahead and tell him, tell Ed Young from the Atlantic to send 20 questions to you right now and that you'll respond to him when the peer reviewed version is available, so when the press package goes out. We've done that numerous times and that works, that seems to work well. So, yeah. okay. Thank you for your comments and, and thank you for your question because my question builds on that. Um, so my question is, are there any copyright considerations PIOs should be thinking about as it pertains to preprint and then when the manuscript gets accepted um, and as it relates to sharing of the information with media? So perhaps just a broader conversation about the this PIO's role in sharing of manuscript. Oh, that's a great, great question. That is a fabulous question. In terms of, for example, images from paper, from preprints, is that the sort of thing you were thinking of? Images and, and generally sharing of the actual research. The manuscript itself. The manuscript itself. Uh, I think that it's an area for me that's not entirely clear. Mm -hmm. um, some journals, obviously, when they're uh, putting out the research and they're giving you the embargo heads up, they want you to share that with the manuscript. But from a copyright perspective, I'd just like to flesh that out a little bit. Um, because as I understand it, the researchers themselves can share the research, the journals 
can share the research. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about this PIO tool in all of this. I'll be honest and say I don't know what bioarchives policy is. At least I don't know if you can speak to archive at all. But um, I, I'm really hoping now that we have a representative from one of these <laughs> servers online who can tell us how they feel about it. Do, do you okay. know? Anything? Well, I mean, until something is published and there's an agreement between the author and the journal, right? That copyright is held by the person who wrote that piece. Right? Ideas, ideas are not copyrighted. The uh, instant. Instantation, is that how you pronounce that word? Of that idea is what's copyrighted, right? So um, until it's in the journal, the researcher owns the rights to all of those images and all of those things. Um, generally, I've found that even after it's published, generally the journals are happy for the scientists to share those images because it promotes the work. But you have to, again, be careful to find out who owns the copyright for that image and who has the rights to that. And then in terms of a press release, um, it's again, That's our copyright. You know, it's all right. That's our copyright, the press release. We don't have to right, worry about but the you're, journal. Not gonna, you're not going to take three paragraphs from the paper and put it in your press release, right? Because yeah. then you're violating the copyright of the journal. So those normal kinds of copyright rules still hold. For, for that process. Um, I guess I should be clear that um, for PLOS journals, all of our work is licensed under a CC BY license, right. so with attribution you could share it. So in right. terms of the published papers, that's very clear. Um, the bit where I, I'd be less clear, and I wouldn't want to speak for BioArchive, and other servers would be in terms of preprints. So my, it sounds like what you're saying. Yeah, Archive doesn't own the copyright right. for anything that's posted on it. It's, a, it's an archive, it's not a, uh, yeah. So like most things, it varies by journal. Some journals are very protective of the manuscript and insist that we, the PIOs, not distribute copies of the paper, that you have to go to their press office, et cetera. Uh, beyond that, I'd have to consult with university counsel to answer your question. I don't actually know the answer. Copyright, copyright law is itself really weird in that there's no copyright police. It's only enforced if the journal were to say, wait a second, and come after you. So I always have a copy of the article, turn the cameras off. I always have a copy <laughs> of the article up my sleeve so to save reporters that step. It's easier for them to just call me and say, send me the paper and I'll send them a PDF and we're done. And we'll be fine with that plus, I know. Yeah, you guys, you don't count. You're all open access and everything, but <laughs> I'm here to tell you there's some very protective publishers. But, but actually, this is a, a, a um, very good place to mention the, the advantage of the preprint server because then you can point the reporter to the preprint version of the ah, paper. No fingerprints, love it. And say, <laughs> well, it's already out there. I haven't uh, <laughs> shared the final one. There's some smine, minor edits. There will be a typo here and there. But yeah. basically, the results are the same. Take that version. Yeah. But if a journal is going to provide you, you know, uh, with a peer reviewed version, I think that's obviously the first part of call, isn't it? Yeah. If yeah. you can. Yeah. Hey. This question may be for Linda primarily, but uh, feel free everybody to chime in. So uh, I have a question with preprint and sort of the process of science. So has, has there been any communication studies or media studies that you're aware of? Does it influence the peer review process? Does it ultimately influence which publishers, which journals are That's choosing? That's a great question. Uh, those based on the which you can do social media activity and ultimately the impact of the particular That's publication. So it's a really good question. Great study idea. Go for it. Well, actually, <laughs> well, I actually, do know I, that there has been research into citations, and specifically um, when mm -hmm. preprints have been posted, you get more citations. So in terms of the broader impact. Um, I also know that some journals are actively seeking submissions from preprints. So that's another way in which the preprint can benefit the scientists. Hmm. So those are two pieces of evidence that that helps. And we actually have um, a, a researcher at Cornell, uh, Bruce Lewinstein, who's the chair of our science and technology department, uh, technology studies department, who uh, told me, you know, the peer review process is not a perfect one. And even journals, uh, which I will not name names, but even a journal that, you know, never, um, uh, you know, is not interested in, in publicity, it's only interested about the science. Um, there uh, was, a, was an editor who paid a lot of attention to that question, and even if it didn't really get a positive peer review, still published it. Mm -hmm. So it's a really messy process, and even though we're using peer review as this gold standard, in reality, um, behind the scenes, it's not necessarily uh, flowing in, in that perfect way. Um, yeah. And in fact, some of my faculty have said, 
you know, we don't actually care about some of these journals that publish all kinds of things. We don't really only trust the peer review for these very specialized subfield journals because then we really know that it's it's a thorough, very um, perfect process, a uh, more perfect process, I should say. So, so. Just always bear in mind that every retracted paper was peer reviewed. Right. Peer review is not perfect, but um, it's still valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not. I'm not speaking against it, I'm just saying that it's, it's important to be, and I think that actually um, raises the, uh, a really important issue for us as PIOs also, which is we are um, sometimes in the position of trying to figure out whether something is reputable research that we should be promoting because, you know, again, just the fact that it's being peer reviewed, we had a situation um, where we had a faculty member who I did not know this at the time, but who was um, not well and had a student who was working with him and the student wrote this paper and had the faculty member's name on it. So I was like, great, you know, this is a renowned faculty member. Okay, this is really interesting. It's kind of different. Well, it turned out that that was a paper that shouldn't see the light of day because in fact it was very not well done, and the faculty member who was uh, not well and elderly was not really, it, the name was on it, but this was not a paper. Um, and that's not something that I would necessarily be able to identify because I'm not an expert in the field. Um, so it's something that taught me that some of the questions that I have to ask are not just is the name on the paper great, but is this something that you know sort of fits into the paradigm of that field? Um, is it you know, within that understood paradigm, is it a trusted source? And if I don't know the answers, then I should check with maybe the chair of that department or somebody else, you know, in that field in my in my school to say, you know, this is just a little odd. This is, you know, just kind of like I or I don't know this person. I haven't worked with them recently. I've is this something that. that I should be promoting? Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. In the same way that we at Plus have access to the editors of our journals, who are experts, and um, those of you who work in institutions hopefully have access to other scientists who are experts. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. I remember you said, Matthias, you have 900 researchers for whom you're responsible. And About, if, yes. Even if a third of them came to you with preprints next week, you, yeah, you would need some kind of filtering mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to ask about peer review on the preprints themselves. We, I, I saw a call to action two weekends ago on Twitter. Someone indicated there were 300 coronavirus papers out there with very little peer review on them. So he was, he was uh, hashtagging and handling different people, institutions, companies who could come in and, and do that work. Have your researchers said that the peer review that they hope for on the preprints is, is happening there? Is, is that something you've talked to them about? I actually asked Paul Ginsberg, uh, the founder of Archive, that very question uh, not too long ago. And he said it really depends on the field. Um, some fields, some, some research communities are really active, commenting, giving feedback, um, really making it an active process. And others, not so much. He said it also depends on the researcher. So people who have good networks are much, or are prominent in the field in some, for some reason. Uh, are more likely to have people commenting on it. He said also if it's a really hot topic, they're more likely, you know, again, within that subfield, they're more likely to have comments and feedback. I'm actually kind of surprised that these coronavirus papers didn't have as much feedback, and I wonder if it's because all of them, people who would normally give the feedback were themselves frantically yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. writing a exactly. paper to put up on Yeah. Yeah, we, um, we know that the overall rate of commenting remains fairly low on preprints, um, though it does vary a lot by discipline. Um, we've actually been supporting um, a, a way of getting uh, more comments on preprints, which is the pre-review platform, specifically that Outbreak Science, so particularly relevant at the moment. Hmm. Um, so it's a way of enabling um, experts to comment very quickly on, on a preprint um, according to a standard form and then those responses can be aggregated to give an overall sense of the uh, opinion of the community on the preprint. Um, so we're quite excited to be promoting that. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Uh, a little, yes. So um, I'm not the expert, but um, yes, it's a... Uh, so because we know that um, freeform comments can take quite a long time, um, and also uh, it's harder to aggregate them, 
Um, the, the pre-review platform aims to do that in a more standardised way, but also in a way that feels lower effort for the researchers. Um, so they answer, I believe it's something like four um, uh, uh, drop-down type questions and a couple of optional free-form questions um, to complete, if you like, a very mini review of, a, of the preprint. That's then posted, and um, when those are aggregated, it gives you more of a sense of what uh, multiple people think about the preprint. So it's intended to be a way to um, encourage commenting on preprints uh, in communities. This is not a PLOS thing, this is something that we're supporting, but it's not a PLOS initiative. Um, it's, I believe it's hosted separately to the preprint server, but it's um, feeding in preprints from the server. Um, as I say, I'm not the expert on this, um, but it is something that's really exciting in this field, so definitely worth having a look at. Yeah, public. I, I want to ask everybody too, how, when you have seen preprints covered in the news, what's the proportion of the time where you're seeing them uh, characterized as preprints, not pre uh, the studies on them are not peer reviewed, and, and when you see them referred to as, as the study, the more definitive uh, item, how, how does that look? I've mostly seen it uh, posted on archive which to the general public means nothing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. we, we do encourage um, the use of the language posted as opposed to published. We think that's an important distinction to be drawn there. Mm. That's great. But do you think that the public would make the distinction between these two? I'm not sure. Um, possibly not. I think scientists probably would understand that distinction. So when we're working with them, I think that's important. I think we have an opportunity here to shape the best practice, don't we? So if we refer to things as posted or published, we can, we can shape that narrative. But, I mean, the words posted on archive, most people don't know what archive is. Right. Yeah, what you don't want to see is published in the archive journal. That would right. be a, a misrepresentation. <laughs> well, but but they will happen. sometimes say, as I said earlier, published at, you know, by Cornell University. <laughs> yeah. Are there any drawbacks? At this point, to publishing on, on a preprint server, are there still some journals that will not accept a submission that has been posted on the preprint server? We certainly are very happy with preprints, and I can't speak to other journals. There may be publishers out there for whom that's the case. Plus, isn't one of them. Um, I'm not clear of other drawbacks. Uh, I suppose the drawbacks would be if a scientist did post a preprint that was high profile and was later found out uh, to be incorrect or to um, have incorrect results in it, um, then that might have a knock-on effect for the scientists. You would hope that um, it would be an opportunity to talk about how science is done, um, but uh, potentially some scientists will be af might be afraid of that, and that might be what's what might be stopping some of them from posting preprints. I don't know if any of you intellectual property considerations would also keep some from using preprints if they think that this idea is something that they could turn into a business. They certainly would not want to do a preprint. But other than that, I can't think of a lot of downside to it. This is actually a problem we face uh, from time to time. So Anvil is also developing new technologies. And while we really try to communicate with our scientists, like if you have a new technology in your paper, don't put it on a preprint yeah. server before the patent is out. Uh, sometimes uh, we have people who weren't listening in the introduction talk and then have it on preprint and are super disappointed that they don't get a patent. Or, or they, they just feel, you know, this is a great tool. I want everybody to be using it. I don't care about the money. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not. There are, there are a there lot are. of scientists really care about that yeah. public good, for sure. Well, some, some scientists also, and, and I think this is more true in the biological sciences, um, have this fear that somebody's going to steal their idea. Yeah. And it's irrational because, of course, You've got this priority date stamp on it, so right. it's actually ways, better than if you're still in exactly. your lab and nobody knows that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. But there's this apparently. I mean, it's 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 changing now, but mm -hmm. it's been it's been an issue, um, as I understand, for, for yeah. certain. They know they know which two or three teams they're racing against, and they don't want to give them any angle. Yeah, yeah. but as Linda says, it can, preprints can be a real opportunity to state that claim yeah. early, but maybe not, not everyone's aware of that. Yeah. You've been very patient. Do you think that journals need to change their peer review process to get a faster turnaround and keep up with the I feel like this is my chance to say that speed is really important to us at PLOS. PLOS One in particular um, has long had as one of its selling points how quickly it um, aims to 
published papers. So I think speeding up peer review is good for science. Um, I think all journals should be doing that anyway. Preprinted shouldn't be the thing that makes them do it. They should always be working to uh, get peer review done as quickly, but also as, of course, as effectively. Yeah, and yet as they want to get it right. This is The publication is going to be the account of record, and mm. it should live forever. Mm, I don't want to rush that. Of course, speed and accuracy, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so from a scientific point of view, I also would say it should be accurate but fast. From a PAO point of view, I would say please leave it at the one month uh, at least yeah. so that we have time to prepare <laughs> yeah, exactly. everything accurately. Exactly. Right. There's a lot of discussion about this very topic um, among scientists, among journals. Yeah. Uh, the journals care quite as much as PLOS One does. But um, as to what should happen with peer review, we've seen in the social sciences a lot of questions being raised about the peer review process and how uh, effective it is in weeding out good science from bad science. Yeah. Um, so I think, and I think the, the push for open access journals is also changing the landscape considerably. So I think there, and I think preprints have contributed to that, you know, that, that uh, ongoing transformation of, of the landscape. And back to Walton from Spring and Nature. I just wanted to go back to the last question around potential downsides to researchers. And we have in some of the Nature journals seen examples where um, there has been enough coverage, media coverage of a preprint that we haven't been able to embargo the paper when it came out. Uh, we obviously work as hard as we can, um, send out a press release for immediate release, do a lot of targeted pitching. We try to make any extra materials available to journalists. Sometimes we'll try to organise a press briefing later, the day, later in the day. But even so, there have been cases where the coverage of something like a really important big paper has been significantly impacted. Yeah. And that is something, and it, it, in terms of the reach that the authors might otherwise have had, might be more limited. And we've had a, a few examples of that. And, in some cases where the researchers have been disappointed um, with the coverage that they got, that they, they had been expecting more um, as a consequence of uh, coverage of the, of the preprint version. <laughs> what fields were those in? Quite varied, actually. So um, there was one, it was a new species of archaea um, that was on a preprint in summer, and there were several uh, specialist reporters who picked up on the preprint as soon as it was published. They also covered quite a few different aspects of the story, so it was like a 12-year endeavor to culture this uh, Archean, and so there were stories about that side of things, but there weren't really any new stories to tell. Um, that one, we did get some coverage from some of the, we got, we got the New York Times, so it was, it was, all, it was all fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hashtag first world problem. <laughs> but, uh, but it was the kind of story that we think we could have seen a lot more coverage than we did. Um, and it's, it's often those papers that, and not the sort of drop everything, hold the front page stories um, are the ones that suffer. Um, we, ha we had a couple of coronavirus papers last week uh, that we issued press releases for immediate release, partly because we also didn't want to do anything to slow the process down in any way, and they did get some pick up um, following the, the press release, but um, I, I might have expected in, in different circumstances, different, different coverage, so it's quite a variety of fields. But yeah. That's on, on, on the other side, we had, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, one other example, we had a, a paper, a quantum, a quantum physics paper last year that um, there was an early version of it. It wasn't on a preprint, but an early version of the paper was leaked for a short period of time. Mm. And we couldn't embargo that press release, but uh, we sent it out for immediate release and held a press briefing with the authors, authors later in the day, and it ended up being one of our biggest papers of the year. So. Mm. It doesn't always impact coverage, but it has to be, I think it's one of those, it's those stories that are going to be the big blockbuster stories anyway will do well, whereas the others that are quite interesting, but reporters would need more time to get their teeth into and to report properly that can be affected in plan. Yeah. I mean, my sense is that the problem there is not necessarily the posting of the preprint this, itself, yeah. Yeah. but the reporting of it. So maybe yeah. it's worth drawing that distinction, <laughs> but I can see how those researchers might feel they'd had a bad experience with preprints. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, maybe a little perspective from the side of the reporter. Um, I once had a case where uh, one of our scientists informed me about a, a big article on photonics. I don't know what, what paper it was, Nature Photonics, but one of the photonics papers. And, um, 
I respected all the the embargo rules, but I uh, formed one of the experienced uh, science writers in the Netherlands. And he did some research and found it on archive. He said, what are you doing? Are are you really heating old stuff for me? This is is not Uh a at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes there is no story. even if it's in a big uh, peer-reviewed paper, it can be the choice of, uh, of a reporter. That's, that's a dilemma I uh, well, hopefully will not <laughs> meet often. But yeah. Had that um, preprint received media coverage, or was it that the journalist just felt the fact it was publicly available at all meant it wasn't worth writing? Well, let's say, um, um, well, it wasn't made, well, let's take the example, it was Today, 14 February 2020, uh, uh, I'm about the embargo of the paper, mm-hmm. and then he does some research on itself, and he says it's already there since 2016. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I'm not going to write about this old stuff. Was this a science journalist or a general science report? Uh, a real experience, one of the best <laughs> science journalists. I, I would have pointed out to him that he still had it first because nobody else covered it. Yeah. I mean, what's yeah. the harm in that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was having a bad day. <laughs> I mean, this, this is, these, uh, the comments from these, the two of you uh, really illustrate the fact that this is not, uh, you know, preprints have not made our jobs easier, right? And, and, and it's, it's messed up and already, you know, it's not like our jobs are easy anyway, and it makes it that much harder when situations like these arise. And part of it, I think, is um, the challenge for us of developing these relationships with reporters so that we can you know, educate them also. Uh, one of the things about preprints, I think, that's, that's also made it a little bit harder for, for us is it used to be that reporters came to us to get to, their ex- to, get to experts. Right? We were the gatekeepers. And it enabled us to have all these opportunities to build these relationships with reporters. And all of a sudden, now they can just go directly to archive. And it's kind of taken that step out of our hands. And, and that, can, you know, that, that puts more pressure on us to find ways to create these relationships in other times. Maybe that was an opportunity to, I don't know, do what with that reporter, but make them happy in some other way or give them something Exclusive, I don't know, um, to keep you know to 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 overcome that that sort of bar that that preprints have created for us. So he was already upset about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that is the trick, right? Because again, this is the scientific process, right? Scientists know that the paper that published in February of 2020. You know, may have started back in 20, 2016, as, as the example you just gave. And that's the scientific process. It's iterative. Mm-hmm. They, they, they did a couple more studies. The peer, you know, this happens with peer reviews, right? Is the, is the reviewer said, oh, no, now you have to do it this way. And, oh, no, you forgot to check with this population. So, so you know, it can take them a year to just get through that peer review process because the reviewers keep asking for more and more and more and more, right? So we know that, the scientist knows that, but reporters may not know that. So in their mind, it's old stuff, but in reality, maybe it isn't so much that it's just this way. But you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, for sure. Can I comment on that? Because Can you do it Can you come to the mic? So yeah, for people questions. online, thanks. <laughs> uh, as a press officer, you provide them with some extra stuff that they won't have in just the preprint, right? Some, maybe yeah. some extra images Better or visual, like so. <laughs> this, uh, this is what you said, plus on top, we already uh, reduced their workload in extracting the main selling points of a 40, 50 pi- page paper if they're unlucky. So they don't have to read the full paper, but okay, they see the story, okay, this is what about, and then they can decide, okay, I have another look at the paper. Mm-hmm. And in the current stressful situation reporters are, where they get an assignment in the morning and probably have to deliver in the evening, that's worth a lot. 
Oh, well, again, that depends on the reporter, right? Because some are like, course, yeah. I don't want to see your press release. Just send yeah. the paper. <laughs> I have a sort of a different question. I'm kind of curious to find out how the PIOs deal with preprints in light of patents. Um, our university specifically, uh, our researchers have a lot of patents and there are a lot of spin-offs that result from our research. And I wonder if you consider it your um, the responsibility of a PIO to check whether all the necessary processes are okay before you um, publish it and also before you communicate about a preprint. Uh, yeah, so we have the luxury at Emble that we have a, a separate organization, the Emblem, which is basically only dealing with uh, patents and spin-off companies. <coughs> so uh, whenever a group leader starts at Emble, they get an introduction course and a very clear statement. If you have a new technology and you want to have a patent on it, don't put it on a preprint server. Inform us as soon yeah. as you basically have started writing the paper uh, and we will deal with all the legal implications yeah. for you. So this is a luxury institution. We do have an innovation office as well, but they have recently asked us to check with them when we are press releasing something because they, mm. have, they are finding out that researchers are not always taking the necessary steps for their patents yeah. before they press release it. I guess it's a lack of awareness. Of yeah, I mean, I mean, if this is the case, then I would suggest that whenever you get in contact or researcher gets in contact with you, you always raise the first question. Yeah. Is there something new is in there, there you want to have yeah. patented? Yeah. Yeah. I like to include that detail when, when they've applied for a patent. I think that helps make it news. I put mm -hmm. that in there. Um, mm -hmm. It's not for our, our office to police whether they've appropriately communicated about their intellectual property. That's the intellectual property office's job. But I've never been asked to do that. But um, yeah, if there's no communication, you're like the last line of defense, so mm -hmm. you better. I mean, that goes back to the earlier point, right, about education. Is yeah. these are the, you know, oh, you want to publicize your work? Well, what, what is it that you're really doing? Um, what happens with that? So I see somehow it's reached 1225. I, I want to take a moment to point out that for, for all your preprint needs, you can call any of the people up here, <laughs> not not me, but them. Um, but but thanks so much to all of our panelists for your insights and answers to so many questions and, and to everybody here for asking. Um, I want to turn it over to Jen to offer some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Megan and everyone. It was a terrific discussion and great to have the audience interaction. I think it's been a really rich discussion here today, so thank you again. Um, I just wanted to quickly close out um, by thanking my colleagues on the Eureka Alert team, uh, Seth Rose, Shelby Toller, Joe Howell-Wood, Noreen Rosario, Tamara Alfson, Spencer Richardson, Jermaine McDonald, and of course our director, Brian Lynn, for making this seminar possible. Um, and thank you to our moderator and our panelists for sharing your expertise today. And thank all of you, thanks to all of you for coming to this seminar and for your support of Eureka Alert and for all you do to communicate science. So if you have not already, um, a little plug to please join our Eureka Alert PIO forum. It's our online discuss discussion group for PIOs and science communicators where you can talk about preprint strategy more and um, and other topics that are relevant to your jobs. So just send an email to pio at eureklert.org for an invitation. And so with that, we have a lot of other new, exciting things coming from Eureka Alert later this year. So please stay tuned and thanks and see you next time. <laughs>